Good morning. This is Senate Judiciary. It is Friday, January 28th, the last Friday of January. Um, we've made it through a month uh, remotely, and we um, are taking up a bill this morning um, that Genesis um, is, for years, we've been trying to deal with criminal threatening and other issues. And um, Ben, uh, it's S-265 and that act relating to expanding criminal threatening to include threats to third persons. And I think it's a little bit deceiving title, but I'm gonna ask uh, Ben uh, from Legislative Council, Nova Grouski, to walk us through the bill. And then we're gonna hear from the Secretary of State and some others. And hopefully the dog will be quiet um, once the person gets in the door. So I'm going to actually. Thank you, Senator Sears. So I will um, go ahead and share my screen to pull up the bill. Bear with me one moment. Can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> So as Senator Sears said, this is Bill S-265, uh, introduced by Senators Clarkson, Sears, Ballant, Cummings, McDonald, McCormick, and Perchlick. Uh, it's an act relating to expanding criminal threatening to include threats to third persons. Uh, the purpose of the bill, um, it proposes to expand the scope of the crime of criminal threatening to include threats to third persons, which would include uh, groups of people and any others. And this bill also proposes eliminating a person's lack of intent or inability to carry out the threat as an affirmative defense. The bill also creates an enhanced penalty for threats uh, made uh, with a threat that they would be carried out in a place of public accommodation. Um, the, the bill really brings uh, as a kind of broad overview before we get into the details of it. The, the bill brings Vermont's criminal threatening statute in line with what is constitutionally permissible and in order to ensure that there are no statutory barriers to effectively address forms of true threats. Um, so with that in mind, I'll go into the details of the bill. So the bill uh, under section one, it amends title uh, section 1702 of Title 13, which is the criminal threatening statute. Uh, the statute currently reads that a person shall not, by words or conduct knowingly, threaten another person, um, and this would add or group of persons, and as a result of the threat, place the other person in reasonable apprehension of death or serious bodily injury to the other person, a person in the group of persons or any other person. So with that addition, with those additions, what that essentially does is that when a threat is made to a group of persons, so it could be a board, a state agency, um, even a group of private individuals, um, and that threat places the other person in reasonable apprehension of death or serious bodily injury um, to the other person, so to them, um, a person in the group that they are associated with, or any other person. So for instance, any other person could mean um, like someone that's part of the person's family. Um, and it's really directed to um, <clears throat> encompass all of those uh, permutations of threats that could uh, place someone that's in reasonable fear of death or injury. And if you scroll down through subsection D, on, which is on page two, lines seven through 10, is revised to create an enhanced penalty for a person who violates subsection A of this section by making a threat that places any person in reasonable apprehension that death or serious bodily injury will occur at a place of public accommodation and shall be imprisoned not more than five years or fine not more than $5,000 or both. And a place of public accommodation means any school, restaurant, store, establishment, or other facility at which services, facilities, goods, um, privileges, and other benefits are offered to the general public. From there, 
Ben, can um, I ask that question? <laughs> yeah. Yes. About that. Um, the place of public accommodation, I'm thinking about a courtroom, for example, where you have screening going on in uh, the courtroom um, in order to get in. Is that also a place of public accommodation, um, even though there's screening and law enforcement there? Yes, that's that's a place of public accommodation. It would fall. I mean, if somebody category. were to threaten the jury, for example. Uh, yes, yeah, so if it met all the other elements of of the statute, um, and it was directed, uh, the person knowingly threatened those people, and they were put in reasonable apprehension of death or serious bodily injury, then then yes, it could be swept into this. Okay, Ben, I, yeah. I'm just wondering, what is the thinking? behind the increased penalty for the action taking place in the place of public accommodation? Well, the, the thinking there is that um, since it's a place open to the public, um, there's, I think it's this balance between uh, potential harm that could occur if the threat were made good on, um, and, and also those places at which, um, you know, places of public accommodation those are places often in which the public's work is done. Um, and yeah. so it may also impede, uh, you know, an agency's work. Um, and I think it, the, the sanction or increased penalties made to recognize um, that balance, that there is more, um, that there's a, a potential danger to the public in a place of public accommodation and also yeah. the potential interference with official duties and, um, and so could, the, okay, could you scroll up so I can see uh, the, the beginning of, um, so the other ones are, so the, the, can you keep going? I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, so, um, and then going down. So it's, it's one, uh, can, I'm sorry, can you go, go down more? Yeah, a person who violates Subsection A is one year, not more than a thousand, and then, and then for subsection C, um, this would um, there's an increased penalty for someone that uh, intends to prevent someone from reporting to DCF uh, for suspected abuse yeah. or neglect of a child. Okay, and so then, it's it's five times the penalty if you make the threat in public. Correct. So if no. I a p place of public accommodation. Yes, yes. correct. Okay. So um, could a place of public accommodation be a bar? Yes. Okay. That uh, that just seems a little odd to me. That so if somebody calls up someone on their cell phone and threatens them or threatens their family, they, it would be one one year or a thousand dollars. But if they happen to say the same thing, not on the cell phone, but in, is that, Jeanette, is, am I un misunderstanding? I, I don't think it's if they make the threat in the place, it is if they t intend to carry it out in the place of public accommodation. Correct. Oh. So, Senator Bruce, oh, so oh, for I example, see. it would be, you know, as an example, you know, I'm going to come to the bar and hurt you or yeah. kill you. Um, and so I think the, the, the rationale behind that is just that when you're going somewhere where there are other people and people are going about their lives and you're threatening that something like that would happen there, uh, that serves as a justification um, because of the fear and impact that it could potentially engender at that public place. As, as one of the sponsors, what I had in yeah. mind in this section is a group of election workers doing a recount. We all saw, uh, I think it was in Michigan, um, where groups of protesters were out in front and there was certainly a threat to those election workers if they found that Biden had gained more votes. Um, and they were, you know, fired up about the steal. And I had in mind here, you know, in Bennington, I've been to several recounts in select board races where you know, I was a member of the Board of Civil Authority, so I'd be there. And what if 
one of the um, candidates was to threaten those poll workers who are yeah. doing the recount. That's what yeah, really I, had in mind, quite frankly. I I I see now the the um, the the that the threat has to be that it will occur at a place. I guess I would still say five times the penalty seems a little um, out I of think, range to me. Right. When we get to the markup, we can certainly talk about penalties and maybe the others. I mean, I always the you know we we've, we've had a lot of discussion in here about. Uh, preventing another person from reporting abuse to DCF. Um, so, you know, maybe that. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, thank, thank you. you ben. That's an Appreciate important it. conversation, I think, to understand what, at least what was intended by the sponsors. Uh, Senator Sears, may I proceed? Yes, please. So, um, the Subsection or new what is newly listed as subsection E is really just uh, a renumbering or relettering rather of the, the preceding sections after D was revised, um, and it makes a couple stylistic changes to subdivision one and two, um, but also adds a new subdivision three, which defines a place of a public a public accommodation as having the same meaning as uh, in nine VSA. Uh, section 4501, and that definition says that a place of public accommodation means any school, restaurant, store, establishment, or other facility at which services, facilities, goods, privileges, advantages, benefits, or accommodations are offered to the general public. Could, could I um, ask Ben that at, at a future meeting, we have a copies of uh, 4501, um, Section and uh, 13, uh, 10, 21. Absolutely. And I, I could pull those up now if you'd like. No, I think it's fine. I, I, I think if we have time later on after we hear from the witnesses, maybe it'd be a good time to pull up 4501 so we all know what public accommodation means and doesn't mean. Okay, of course. Um, and moving on, uh, as I said, one of the reasons, yeah. just to keep in mind, one of the things that's been happening in many states, including Vermont, is protesters going to somebody's house. Obviously, it's not a place of public accommodation, but they are there to reach a goal. And at what point that might become a threat to the family of the elected official or whatever, right? So maybe it'd be a good idea to have a discussion of that. Yeah. Um, and uh, so to proceed on, uh, as you can see on lines 18 and 20, uh, subsections E and F are changed to F and G. Um, and then in section 20 on our line 20 on page two and on to line uh, two onto page three, there's a revision that removes um, the affirmative defense of um, having the inability to carry out the threat. So now it reads that it shall not be an affirmative defense to charge under this section that the person did not have the ability to carry out the threat or did not actually intend to carry out the threat. Previously, it was uh, an affirmative defense that the defendant could prove and was required to prove by a preponderance of the evidence. So that means more likely than not. And so this revision um, removes that option uh, from the defendant's uh, affirmative defenses. Senator Sears? Yes, Senator White. Um, <clears throat> this isn't a question for Ben, but when we get there, I would really like to have a conversation about that section. Okay. Yep. And um, again, in this section, ahead, also, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Sears. No, go ahead. I was just saying, go ahead. In <laughs> uh, this section, also um, <clears throat> is in line with U.S. constitutional and Vermont constitutional law. Um, there has been much discussion within the Vermont Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court about the limits of limiting our uh, limits of, of free speech. And I just want to emphasize that 
this takes language directly from a uh, U.S. Supreme Court president that the intent to not carry out the threat really isn't captured by um, those First Amendment limitations. So again, this is in line to expand our statutory structure to be within the bounds of the constitutional limitations. It just kind of fills the gap so that there are no issues between what uh, can be prosecuted and what is constitutionally permissible uh, to be prosecuted. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to further elaborate more on that if the committee would like. Well, I actually had a personal experience with that. When we were doing civil unions in 2000, I received a threatening letter before email, obviously. And I reported it to the Capitol Police. They checked it out. Um, the guy was in Minnesota in a wheelchair. So they basically said there's no way he could have carried out that threat. But I was still concerned. You know, until I heard that, I was concerned about the threat. Um, it didn't make a difference in what I decided to do, but it, it was serious. Um, so. But under that current law, you know, he, because he couldn't reasonably carry out the threat. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair. Yep. I, I agree with uh, the intent here. Um, you know, it, it seems that what, what you're trying to do if you're issuing that threat is terrorize the person and if possible, change their, their actions uh, yeah. or punish them if they don't change their actions. And those things happen whether or not they intend to carry it out. Um, so I, I go along with how this is worded now um, because, you know, I, I have been on the receiving end too. Um, I'm sure you have. Of threats and had the FBI get involved. And at that point you have to go to your family and say, um, don't freak out, but the FBI is looking into a threat against us. And that all that psychic damage occurs whether or not the person has the ability to carry it out. So, so I'm, uh, I see that the, uh, the intent and I agree. So are we gonna have the discussion on this now or? No, I, I, oh. uh, we're gonna have plenty of discussion about all okay. of this as okay. time goes on. But I, as, you, as normally we do, um, Ben <laughs> is walking us through the bill. Then we're gonna hear witnesses today and next Wednesday, hopefully, and continue. Then we would mark up the bill and have discussions about whether we wanna go forward, uh, make additions, yeah. not whatever. Um, so I can actually read section two pretty easily, Ben. <laughs> yes, and uh, well, section two, as, as you can see, Senator Sears, um, is that the, is the effective date and that the act shall take effect upon passage. Yeah. I actually, when um, the other bill was introduced, the McCormick bill, um, I got an immediate email from my uh, town clerk saying the problem is here now and, and I I have a real problem with having an effective July 1. Um, she was there had been several threats to town employees that day actually that the bill was introduced so um, I'm pleased that we have an effect on passage effective on passage excuse me all right anything else for Ben why don't we go Oh, okay. Yes, Senator Nicka. I was just wondering if we could get a copy of the federal law that uh, came I up. Think, uh, I think we can. I'm sure we can. And maybe the Supreme Court decisions. Uh, absolutely. And I'm also, if you'd like, I could give a, an overview of sort of the, the truth that threat doctrine and sort of the finer details of this now or at a later time. I um, think at a later time. I think Rory... Um, I hate to use his first name. The Washington County State's Attorney, um, I think, is a witness, Tebow, and uh, may provide that. He, 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 I got to have. I must give him a lot of credit for having worked on draft of this, and because, uh, as you know, there were. Well, I'll let the witnesses talk about it, but um, I, I think a lot of this was um, ideas that he developed in his knowledge of federal law and his background. 
No, it may come up then, Alice. If not, okay. we'll certainly Great. have a discussion of it. All right. Um, if you want to take that down, Ben, and, and uh, we'll hear from our first witness. Oh, by the way, these, the, uh, we, our first witness on the agenda was supposed to be the Attorney General's office, and uh, they are concerned about a civil case that's ongoing right now, and they wanted to wait until Wednesday next week. I believe Julio Thompson will be the witness with the Attorney General's office, but it, it was only that concern for a case that came up, I believe, this week. Um, Senator, yes, Senator White, yeah. I, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the fact that whether I agree or disagree with this bill, I'm not a co-sponsor and I'm not a co-sponsor on any bill. If you look at the co-sponsors, because I didn't have time to read them when people were sending them out to get co-sponsors. So I just ignored everything. So okay. I'm not a co-sponsor on any bill, I believe. All right. Well, good to know. Thank you. Um, I know uh, Senator Clarkson sent it out widely, and uh, yeah. this was the list that we had. And this is what we went. I didn't have time to read any of them. <laughs> are, you, are is someone asking if we are co-sponsors? No, no, no. I was just, um, I, I just, I know that a number of people have asked me about a number of bills. Why I didn't? Constituents oh. have asked me why I didn't co-sponsor a particular bill, and I said because. When they come out, I don't have time to read all those hundred bills that come out to see if I want to be a co-sponsor. So I just didn't do any of them. That's all. Good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. Oh, something I haven't read. Action is unstable. So if I freeze, Senator Baruth, you can take over. But our first witness is the Vermont Secretary of State, James Condos. Jim, welcome to Senate Judiciary. Thank you, Senator Sears, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this issue of threats to election workers. Although my comments will be specific about election workers, um, I, I, I want to be clear that this is affecting elected officials throughout the state. Um, my testimony today really is meant to inform your efforts to strengthen Vermont statutes uh, across this country secretaries of state and other election officials, including their staffs and election workers, remain in the crosshairs for violent threats and actions. And we're not immune here in Vermont. Nationally, we are seeing longtime experienced election le leaders and their staffs leaving their positions for other work because they've had it. This is it. This has crossed the line. Uh, so let me just start with, the, I'm going to just read you an excerpt of one of the voicemails that we received. Now, I know that Senator Sears and Senator White in their roles as chair uh, had been given one of these voicemails, but uh, let me just read you one of these, and I caution you may find this offensive. Quote, unquote, justice is coming. All you dirty sea suckers are about to get effing popped. I effing guarantee it. That was one of the comments that we got. This brief ex excerpt from one of the voicemails left my staff, to my staff, was from a caller who was upset with the results of the 2020 election. It was fueled by conspiracy theories that we've seen all, that we've all seen online and even spread by our former president. The notion that this could escalate to physical danger is really not far-fetched. Here in Vermont, we are well aware we had a death of a state employee, Laura Sobel, in 2015, and the threat recently made to Speaker Kerlinski just because they were doing their jobs. And I can report to you that several of my colleagues in other states, for instance, Georgia, Arizona, Colorado, Michigan, are continuing to receive threats just as we have. In some of these instances, their state law enforcement is providing 24-7 security. Comments like, we know where you live, what type of car you drive, or protesting in front of their homes. Uh, and I, you know, Senator Sears, you mentioned that about protesting in front of their homes. The Michigan uh, secretary has had protests in front of her home, and she has a young child who's in school and has concerned her greatly. My deputy, Chris Winters, and I take the personal safety of our staff very seriously. We have 
undergone as a safety appraisal of our building completed by BGS and the Vermont State Police. Our building now remains locked 24 hours a day. We are awaiting an estimate of cost for which we have not been uh, able to budget yet before we can take further steps. I wanna be clear, I do not fault law enforcement in any way. They have to make their judge best judgments based on the laws of the state after they've investigated the, the incident, which as we discovered in this instance, fell short because of the law. I'm not an attorney and I'm certainly not a constitutional law attorney. I understand there are protected speech uh, rights that exist. My belief is that these voicemails probably do cross the line. Although they did not name me or any specific individual, they were directed at my, my office and my elections team. They came through an elections line. Some of the comments, and these are paraphrased, put a gun in your mouth and pull the trigger. There is a reason they're bringing back firing squads and you are next. You are about to be popped. We're going to destroy you and destroy the Secretary of State. Words do matter. And we've had, and they have had a direct impact on of traumatizing uh, election members of, of, of Vermont with at least one member of my staff who was so fearful to leave work to walk to his vehicle. In the late spring, he ended up with PTSD like symptoms and took about 10 weeks off using his leave time in FMLA to receive heavy counseling. After we received the October voicemails, this person was again showing signs of fear and trauma that were clearly resurfacing. On the national level, even the US Senate has held a hearing on these ongoing threats and they continue to, as they continue to escalate because of the perpetuation of the stolen election myth and conspiracies by elected officials who should know better than to spread lies. Now, closer home to home here in Vermont, right after the 2020 November election, uh, we received three extremely disturbing graphic and threatening voicemails to our office. Two came in directly to our elections office and one came through the Office of Professional Regulation. These voicemails were turned over to the US Attorney, the FBI, Vermont State Police, the Attorney General, the Washington County State's Attorney, Montpelier Police, Capitol Police, and BGS Security. That was a team of law enforcement that we had, a consortium that we had put together prior to the November election in case we had any incidents that we needed to be, uh, that we needed to be concerned about. After a review and investigation, we were informed that the, the phone was untraceable, it was probably a burner phone, and they felt the threats did not cross the actionable threshold set by Vermont law. Uh, subsequently, this past summer, Reuters uh, News out of D.C. had contacted us and requested copies of the voicemails, which we did provide to them since the investigation was considered closed. They were doing a nationwide investigation of threats to election officials. This is where it gets interesting. The Reuters reporters took the voicemails, which listed a phone number, and called the phone number and they actually made contact with the individual. They had interviewed him for approximately three hours as they were trying to understand what was motivating these callers to make these threats. Reuters believes, and I'm sorry to say this, Senator Shear, Reuters believe this individual does live in Vermont and most likely in Bennington County. The reporters actually flew to Vermont to interview us and others, including SA uh, Rory Tebow. They also interviewed other individuals who had made threats to other secretaries across the country. In mid-October, we received three more voicemails, even more disturbing, full of expletives that appeared to be from the same individual who had threatened us last November. The reporter's conversation with this person eventually soured and they became the target of over 150 text voicemails and other threats. By the way, we can supply, we have copies of those voicemails and we could supply them. I know Senator Sears and Senator White have heard at least one of them, but uh, we can supply all six of them, I believe, uh, as we have, we have those uh, saved. The individual claims he was con contacted by federal law enforcement 
and is of the belief that it was one of the Reuters reporters impersonating a federal officer. They did not. He also believed Reuters was in collusion with our office. They are not. Among the threatening personal messages he sent to them was a message that he was going to destroy them and destroy the Secretary of State. We believe it was this recent incident that triggered him to call our office again in October and leave the, th the re most recent threatening voicemails. I also want to point out that when we are discussing the safety and protection of election workers, it's not just our Secretary of State's office. That includes, as Senator Sears said, Vermont's hardworking municipal clerks and their election officials all across the state. Um, the select board and school board members are also being targeted as you can see it in the papers almost on a daily basis. For instance, the bills they are considering right now in Maine arose after two town clerks were targeted, uh, threatening them with violence. Unfortunately, this has happened elsewhere in the country as well. In my conversations with law enforcement at, at the uh, Public Safety and with Washington County Rory Tebow, we were told that the federal law has a much clearer standard, has been litigated up to the Supreme Court. We know the guardrails and it is easier to act upon and that Vermont law is somewhat weak. Um, I'm not gonna get into the bill itself. I'm gonna let uh, State's Attorney uh, Rory Tebow speak to that and let him provide his thoughts on the language that can pro provide some help. I wanna say again to you, my former colleagues, thank you for all you do to, to serve Vermont. Um, and at this point, I don't know if you wanna, uh, Senator Sears, turn it over, but I know Chris Winters has some comments as well, my yeah. dear. There may be some questions for you, Mr. Secretary. So I, right. I will, will, will um, see if I, I have actually wanted to point out, I have talked to Reuters as well, um, actually met with a reporter from there. Um, and uh, geez, I'm so unstable that I just lost my video. No, 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 no it's can, not you that's unstable. You. It's your internet. Oh, we can see you. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm going to, I don't know why I, I'm getting, let me see if I, I'm trying to get back on. Here we go. Oh, I'm back. Oh, I just lost it again. I'm going to just, Peggy, I'm just, can you hear me and see me? Yes, we can hear and see you. Okay. Dick, I, I think. Something is happening here. It's okay on this end. Uh, every time I... Dick, you want me some, to uh, yeah. take over for a minute and, and while you get it? No, I think I'm back. I think okay. I'm back. All right. Oh, God, I hate this. Um, <laughs> Jim, I, I've also talked to Reuters. Um, and yes, that they believe the person was from Bennington County, um, but they don't know for sure. But I, it's important to note that not only have our election workers been threatened, reporters have been threatened. And that's not just um, on this case. We have um, cases in Manchester uh, where the Manchester Journal reporter was threatened um, by someone um, for doing a story about a particular organization up there in uh, Poultney. Um, so it's not, I just to make clear, um, while obviously um, the threats to government officials concern us all, it's also threats to um, individuals um, around the state that's becoming more common. I wonder if you, um, as you've, you know, been the subject of this. Are you able to get help for your staff through any state agency or through the um, local mental health agency or others? Um, we've encouraged any staff member who feels threatened or feels the need to use the state-sponsored uh, employee assistant program, the EAP. Um, I, I do know that the election worker that I was speaking of went through heavy counseling for, like, like I said, for about 10 weeks. Um, mm -hmm. 
it's, you know, this is, it, it really, when, when you walk out the door of our building, which is right across the street from the state house on State Street, uh, you kind of look over your shoulder to see if there's anybody around uh, as you walk to your car in the parking lot. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, we've had individuals who obviously have uh, mental health issues on the street, yelling at our building, yelling at the state house, right in front of us. Uh, and, you know, we typically will contact security, let them handle it um, because they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, they're able to de-escalate uh, and, and get the person to move on. But, but this is, it's becoming more and more evident um, across the country. It's not just here. Fortunately, it is. Yeah. Senator Benning. <clears throat> Jim, I would like to take you up on your offer of getting a copy of the voicemails. We can do that. Thank you. Any other questions for the secretary? Okay, why don't we uh, head to the deputy secretary, Chris Winters. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to testify. Chris Winters, I'm the Deputy Secretary of State, I've been the, the Deputy to Secretary Condos for the last seven years now. And I'll just add a little bit to his, his remarks, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, as you all know, the right to vote is an important one. It's a, it, we often like to say it's the cornerstone of our democracy. And we rely on hundreds of election workers across the state to carry out a, a very serious task and enable that most important right through the impartial administration of federal, state, and local elections. So in Vermont, those 246 municipal clerks are in charge of elections for their cities and towns. Uh, and you heard Secretary Condos talk about the threats that are made to our office, but we're also very much concerned about the clerks and the election workers and the ones who make this possible in every town and who may even be more vulnerable to this sort of threat and intimidation than we are here at the Secretary of State's office. Uh, perhaps not coincidentally, the majority of election workers are women, and the vast majority of these cowardly, often anonymous callers are men. You heard the Secretary talk about some of the Secretaries of State in other states, uh, Secretaries Hobbs, uh, Benson, um, secretaries in Pennsylvania uh, and some of these other states in Colorado uh, are subject to uh, a lot of threats and intimidation, uh, and they all just happen to be women. Uh, we haven't heard about many threats from our own town clerks. Uh, it does happen, but we haven't heard of a lot of them. But we are very concerned that the worst is yet to come. And as someone who has to be on Facebook and Twitter, uh, I help run our, our communications here in the Secretary of State's office, and I have to monitor and, and produce some of that content. Uh, you'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised, at how much disturbing language and content is being carelessly thrown about out there in the, in the Twitterverse or on, on Facebook in the form of accusations, of really serious wrongdoing with no evidence and often no basis in reality. It's not uncommon to see talk of treason and execution among those, those comments that are just casually thrown about. So across the country, we're seeing these threats increase and escalate. And some states, as, as we've mentioned, have it much, much worse than we do. Um, in that Reuters report that Secretary Condos mentioned earlier, there were some 850 serious threats that they cataloged, and certainly there are way more than that. Just knowing the impact that these six phone calls had on me personally and on our staff here at the Secretary of State's office, I can't imagine the impact that this had on thousands and thousands of hardworking election officials' lives. Um, in a New York Times poll that was conducted in July, the paper found that one in three election officials felt unsafe in their jobs. So anecdotally speaking, we're hearing from Will Senning, who's our, our, our elections director, that several of his counterparts in other states, they're getting done. They're leaving their jobs af after a, a really stressful election season during a pandemic. With the, the stress from that, compounded by rough treatment after the election, including accusations of cheating and even some of these threats that we're talking about. They've decided it's just not worth it, which is sad because you won't find 
any more dedicated public servants than the folks who work in elections. They're the boots on the ground for our democracy and they're, they're really passionate and invested in the right to vote for everyone. So it's a real uh, extra slap in the face and, and uh, just totally demoralizing to be uh, threatened after you've worked so hard to protect the right to vote. So I bring this up uh, because it, it, it really could become a crisis when good people are afraid to do these very important jobs. And so the threats against our election workers just for doing their jobs are, are an assault on that cornerstone of democracy that I, that I opened with here. Um, so uh, from the elections perspective, this is a really important bill and, and really important work that you're doing. And I wanna thank you for your time and for taking this up today. Well, thank you, Chris, for your testimony. It's really important. I, I wanna, remind those who may be watching um, or who may see this later that it's, um, it, it is pervasive around the country. We lost you, Senator. <clears throat> he'll, he'll unfreeze in just a sec. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Where we see store owners, is that better? Where we see store owners threatened for trying to enforce a mask main mandate or something of that nature. Uh, I, our focus here so far with witnesses, I want to make clear this, this bill goes well beyond. Um, and I also want to, in 2019, following um, the decision by a state representative from Bennington not to run again due to much of this nature and polling and et cetera. We tried to introduce some changes to our hate crime statutes. Um, Senator Campion and I introduced a bill on that in 2019. It actually was taken up here in the Senate and the House was also dealing with it. And at some point the House um, couldn't come up with an agreement on it. So I wanted to make clear that those, it, this, this is somewhat different than that, is that focus was on hate motivated crimes. And uh, so just, just for the record. Um, are there questions for Chris or additional questions for the secretary? I'm still with us. I want to thank you both for coming, and I also want to thank you both for continuing to serve in these difficult times. And I'd like to add a comment, if I might, just about the dedication of the elections officials, whether or not they're receiving um, uh, threatening messages, because I, I really do, as Chris said, see them as the bedrock of our democracy and, and all the other changes that we make um, would be less meaningful if we did not have our um, democracy and our voting rights, so. Thank you, Senator. All right, our next witness, witness, our next witness is Rory Thibault, the uh, state's attorney for Washington County and who got involved in this because Washington County is where our capital is and where the threats were received. So Rory, why don't you take it over and uh, thank you for being here. Good morning, Senator Sears and uh, members of the committee. I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to testify. For the record, uh, Rory Tebow and I am the Washington County State's Attorney. I wanna provide a little bit of context to why this is such an important issue um, you know, for me and ultimately the constituents here in Washington County. As the home to our state government, we have a lot of government employees here, whether they are working for the executive branch, the legislative branch, or the judiciary. And the threat environment uh, in the past two years has been unprecedented. Uh, Vermont, I think, has long, for a long time, been able to pride itself on the fact that we're a small state. People are generally civil. We know people in our communities. Yet uh, the hyper national and hyper-partisan political environment, coupled with um, the big lie, if you will, and other uh, af the other aftermath and effects of the 2020 election has led to uh, a difficult environment, especially for election workers and for individuals who are trying to just dispense and do their constitutional or duties to the state of Vermont. 
criminal threatening has always been a challenging topic to deal with because, again, in looking to our Vermont values, we place a high value on freedom of speech and expression. Of course, there have to be some limits to that. And um, Vermont and the federal government operate under the same constitutional uh, framework, which is um, threats need to constitute a true threat in order for there to be a criminal penalty or sanction. My ultimate assessment of what S-265 strives to do is to um, remove in some ways the false ceiling that we've created um, in a statutory framework in Vermont. Uh, comparisons to other states and to federal law is not to say that there's a different constitutional standard, rather it's to say how we realize or how we react to uh, these threats depends a lot on how statutes are written. Uh, the committee has already heard from legislative counsel that of the key changes, and one of the most important ones is removal of the affirmative defense. And um, hearing both Senator Sears and Senator Baruth share their personal experiences with that, I think it bears you know, repeating and is a huge issue. The terror or fear or intimidation that someone feels from a threat in that moment doesn't matter whether they know or don't know if someone is capable of doing that. We're fortunate as elected leaders and government officials to have uh, resources, whether it's BGS security, the Capitol Police, or any other you know, immediate response from law enforcement to assist us. Um, an election worker in a remote part of the state may you know, unfortunately have to wait a longer period of time to get an, a response when they feel threatened. Uh, it's just the nature of, of how business works um, in, in terms of being in a rural uh, state. So I, I agree with both Secretary Condos and Mr. Winner's uh, description of the fear and issues that exist uh, when we're talking about our municipal and local boards or election workers who are spread out. Um, again, the, the threat environment is just fundamentally different than it was, say, two years ago. Ultimately, uh, I start my comment a little bit more about the affirmative defense. Uh, the affirmative defense is somewhat of an odd creature in Vermont's statutory uh, regime. Uh, I filed sup as a supplement to uh, this testimony today, a fairly lengthy presentation with an executive summary and then a deep dive into our current threat statutes. If, you know, if anyone wants to take a look at that past subsequent to the testimony or, or learn more or see some of the direct constitutional language used by the US and the Vermont Supreme Courts on this issue. Uh, why I say the affirmative defense is out of sync is because there's, when we're looking at threats by words or conduct, there's no other um, analog to it. When we look at uh, our false public threats uh, statute, which is really limited to bombing threats or you know, catastrophe uh, someplace in public, there's no affirmative defense that applies there. Uh, instead, we measure the harm and impact on society by the fact that those words or conduct leads to evacuations or pandemonium. Looking to the definition of public accommodation, um, I would defer to the uh, committee really on whether that's the appropriate scope or whether it should be narrowed. Um, I think the ultimate goal here is to ensure that um, whether it's called a public accommodation or not, that our, um, our state and municipal buildings, including the state house or state office buildings, are areas uh, where there's a heightened level of, of concern and awareness. Uh, whether that needs to extend to every single bar or shop uh, out there um, is a policy question. I'd also add, though, that historically, uh, outside the context of threats towards elected officials, we've also seen an increase the past few years of threats occurring inside or being directed at schools or also places of worship. These, uh, while they're not necessarily, you know, legislative or executive government buildings, they are critical infrastructure within our communities. And um, you don't have to look far around the state to see circumstances where threats directed towards schools have resulted in um, you know, numerous students electing to stay home or generating um, really an unprecedented degree of fear and concern in those uh, communities. So at the end of the day, the most important takeaway from this, uh, from, all, from all these proposed modifications is this is not an, an endeavor or an attempt to outwit, outmaneuver, or somehow change the constitutional standard for what is and what is not protected speech. Rather, as I mentioned before, this is eliminating the uh, false ceiling, so to speak, between uh, what our statutes allow us to do versus what the constitutional limit is. And I think Legislative Council did an excellent job articulating that this covers some of those gaps. Um, aside from the affirmative defense, also ensuring that the statute clearly applies for um, the application to both groups uh, and um, is important as well. Another notation as well, when looking and thinking about the penalties, criminal threatening in contrast disturbing the peace by electronic means or any of our disorderly conduct statutes 
is predicated upon a threat to inflict serious bodily injury or death. So just saying, I want to punch somebody or, you know, I'm going to slash your tires if you don't do X or Y is not subject to Vermont's criminal threatening statute. Instead, this is really focused on the greater degree of harm. And so I think that is part and parcel of why criminal threatening has an enhanced penalty versus, say, aggravated disorderly conduct, and also why the proposal here has included um, a felony enhancement for public accommodation as currently drafted. What I would note is this, uh, what, you know, the question may be, why have a felony enhancement? Uh, one of the important collateral consequences that comes uh, from the felony offense, as many uh, of you will know and recall from other, other circumstances, is Brady disqualification. And upon a felony conviction, prohibiting someone from obtaining firearms or other uh, dangerous, deadly weapons in some circumstances. Um, so I understand clearly that this committee has focused on much of its effort in the past few years looking at ways to defelonize or reduce the exposure or um, you know, rationalize Vermont's laws with contemporary attitudes and rehabilitation. Uh, but sometimes there are collateral consequences that are proportionate and fit with the relative degree of harm done. And from uh, my office's standpoint, um, you know, we feel that when there is a, a threat or a conviction based upon this type of behavior directed towards, let's say, the Secretary of State or the Attorney General or the Governor or, or more, uh, more on the ground level, a DCF worker or a corrections worker uh, who's part of the state government apparatus, uh, that that may or should require uh, an enhanced response or the ability to ensure that the person is deprived of the means to act out upon such threats in the future. With that said, I'm, I'm more than happy to take uh, questions and discuss process or other uh, considerations, but those are, uh, from my perspective, some of the most important things that uh, we're considering as practitioners in looking at how to best protect um, the numerous state government and elected officials here in Washington County. Uh, my question, Rory, and I thank you for being here. It's actually um, based upon news stories. We didn't talk about it, but um, can you talk a little bit about your frustration when these threats occurred and not being able to prosecute or at least investigate um, because of the limitations of current Vermont law? I remember your a few of your quotes in the in articles. Yeah, and I think one of the notable ones is this, that you know, our Constitution allows us to be really impolite, mean, crude, rude, and nasty to one another. But when that crosses into a line where it is making people afraid to do their job or dispense their duties, or um, you know, I think as many have experienced, having to have that you know, very real conversation with family members of you know, showing pictures of, if you see this person, call 911 immediately, or if you notice anything arrives, you, know, you, you need to get in the house. Um, and, I think that what's difficult for us as prosecutors, um, you were looked to to help solve problems and keep the public safe. The you know, fundamental, aside from dispensing the laws in a, a just, fair, and impartial way, um, one of our other, you know, I think most important duties as prosecutors is the you know overarching goal of public safety, and um, that that goal is frustrated when um, you know we have victims or um, people who feel impacted by actions of others in the community who come to us for help or protection and then ultimately you know, get nothing. Um, there's, I can give as an example, I can't talk about it in too much detail because it involves a, a juvenile matter, um, but you know, we had a, a threat in a school that um, we could not, because of the way the criminal threatening statute's written, we could not get a finding of probable cause within the family division. It left our only recourse as seeking an extreme risk protection order, uh, which while it's not you know, a criminal action, it does prevent um, access to or purchase of firearms for a period of six months. Extending that can be difficult, but um, ultimately we're sometimes left with a very limited set of tools to respond to something that, while it may be constitutionally protected, places people in uh, duress, fear. And, um, and ultimately when we look at that through the lens of uh, schools or uh, public officials, every Vermonter has a vested interest in ensuring that their legislators, their judges, and their state government employees discharge their duties in a manner consistent with the law, and they're not afraid or they're not avoiding doing or taking controversial action because they fear that there will be repercussions, either in harm inflicted upon them, on their family, their property, or their reputation. Um, so this is, where, this is quite frankly where I'm not a constitutional law scholar. Um, I really greatly appreciate in, in drafting this that um, uh, 
we had the assistance of Legislative Council. Um, ben is a recent practitioner, I think, is very well suited to address these issues and analyze them for the committee. I also have to give appreciation and thanks to Evan Meenan uh, from our department, who was also integral in doing some of the background research and digging into the model penal code for this. The, uh, the end state is this, that um, Vermont, by Vermont's statutory regime does leave um, gaps, and uh, I'd rather have us be able to approach and utilize the extent of the law up to those constitutional boundaries and not have to explain uh, to a potential or, or putative victim that we, we won't prevail because of the existence of an affirmative defense or that we won't prevail because the threat was directed towards a group, not towards a particular person. And just to put it in, in plain terms, and this is in the summary I filed uh, as a document to the committee, notwithstanding changes here, it would still be incredibly difficult or unlikely to be able to hold to account the individual who made threats to the Secretary of State's office. There are a number of reasons for that, including really the application as, um, as legislative counsel referenced to the true threats doctrine, which requires that a true threat is something that is first a serious expression to do something, that it conveys an intent to commit unlawful violence, that there be some element of volition to it, that there be quote unquote gravity of purpose, and that there is some uh, measure of likelihood of execution. In this particular case, many of the threats were uh, conditional or indirect. Um, the caller during the course of these threats didn't indicate that he would do anything himself. It's implied that others would do so. There's also references to the authorities taking action in some of these. So the question is if there's you know, a threat that's ostensibly an action or you know, government action that results in some harm to somebody can that constitute threat. Uh, you know, rhetorically is telling someone to kill themselves a threatening you know, comment. And the answer from different case law and review is likely no. And then finally, um, particularity as to a particular person is uh, important. And also, I I'll go into one case of Supreme Court law I think uh, is worth looking at, and it's Watts versus United States. And this is a um, decision rendered during the course of the Vietnam War. And in very plain terms, it involved an individual uh, who upon receiving a draft card, uh, basically indicated that after going to basic training, the first person he was going to aim his rifle at was LBJ. The US Supreme Court ultimately determined that that was protected speech and found that it was political hyperbole and that he did not have a, a reasonable likelihood of actually carrying out that threat. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, I hope we, the president at the time was still sleeping easy uh, based upon that being said, but it does give context that there are uh, still a lot of um, protections for speech built into the U.S. and Vermont Constitution and our respective courts' interpretations of that. Thank you. Uh, other questions for Rory? I do note that you provided us with a review of proposed bills and other considerations and quite a lengthy document, um, and it's on our web page. You'll also find um, other um, testimony, um, it's written testimony from the ACLU. We will try to hear from them next week. And uh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, Senator White, do you have questions for? Yeah, yeah. I, um, when you were talking, I made um, a note that said, um, this is what my notes said. This may not be what you said. So if you would just elaborate on this a little bit. I wrote that state offices and um, uh, places are more vulnerable and that maybe the definition of public accommodation was too broad in this. And I just wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit because I wasn't sure I heard it right or that I interpreted it right. Sure, so to speak to public accommodation, um, first that definition comes from uh, Title IX, which really deals with uh, commerce and other you know, business activities in the state. So it expressly says public accommodation, including uh, school, but it also says, I think makes reference to business, a restaurant, other, other places like that. I think where it captures or would tend to capture state government buildings is or other places providing uh, services, privileges, or benefits, which um, you know, it could be broadly construed. I, I would defer to Ledge Council on um, whether that definitely includes um, state government buildings or the state house itself. Oh, okay. I think I missed, I interpreted it the other way. I thought you were saying that that might be that 
expanding this to all places of public accommodation might be too too broad. Well, I think you know to answer that directly, I think that's a policy choice for um, you know for the committee ultimately. Um, I understand Senator Bruce comments in particular that, you know, a threat directed towards a bar or a restaurant or because the recipient of a threat is sitting there, you know, should it be subject to enhancement? I think from a practical standpoint as a prosecutor, I would say, you know, generally no. Um, it can sometimes be difficult to capture the essence of, you know, what we're trying to criminalize or penalize at an enhancement level. But ultimately, in, in as plain in terms as I can say, the goal here is to make sure when there's a threat that impacts a class of people or a particular building or, you know, a particular organization in the building uh, that they're be a mechanism to respond to that. So a threat directed against, you know, DCF workers as a class of persons, let's say, or, you know, a threat directed towards the staff at the Secretary of State's office, you know, they may occupy the, that place. And ultimately the goal here, I think, is to look at um, individuals who are performing, uh, whether it's election work, whether it's just the, the core functions of state government, um, measuring harm. It, certainly the, it, the harm to an individual is certainly, we can all agree, bad. When that harm extends to an entire class of individuals and results in a disruption of state government or election functions, then I think we can agree that the harm is, to some extent, greater. Yeah, I'm not worried about that. I mean, I, I agree with that. I, I just, my, I guess my question was, is, is, a, is extending it to um, all places of com public accommodation too broad an interpretation? And I don't, I don't know. I'm just wondering. Yeah, and I, I would note this as well. So, you know, sometimes when we have an elected state's attorney appearing, um, you know, we sometimes appear on our own accord, sometimes on behalf of the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs. Um, at this point, I wouldn't take a position on that either for my office or for the department. But I think that ultimately is a policy question that, uh, to consider with, I think, where there would be greater consensus among our department would be looking towards um, schools, state government centers, places of worship, uh, places that are somewhat obvious versus just the more broad category of public accommodation. Hey, thank well, you. I, I want to, you know, I don't know if it would cover, you know, it's certainly been in the news, the Slate Ridge and the controversy there and the threats to public officials, as well as neighbors in that area, which, um, which is in Rutland County. Um, and I, I do think, you know, you, um, the intimidation there of both the reporter, uh, zoning officials, court officials, and others is clear. Um, you know, it's interesting that um, the, uh, as I understand it, um, the Agency of Natural Resources uh, failed to go in because of fear, as did the, um, but the state police were monitoring the situation. That's what I kept seeing about it. So I, I think that's a very real situation that involves not just government officials, but neighbors and et cetera. So um, that's where I, the place of public This is, uh, as you said, um, this is pervasive around the country now where um, and so I, I want to make sure we cover that. And also, if, if somebody chooses not to run, you know, for the state house or chooses not to run for re-election because of these threats, that's very real as well. Now, Jim, uh, excuse me, the secretary mentioned some of uh, election officials in other states have chosen not to run for re-election because of these threats. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there other questions for Rory? This has been enlightening and very helpful. Um, Matt Valerio, would you like to testify next week? Let Peggy know. Um, I see you're on. Yeah, I, we um, uh, should have invited you today, and uh, that's my, my fault. That's okay. I, I was sure you were going to bring it up again. Oh, yeah. The plan is to bring this up again next Wednesday and have a, 
thorough discussion of it um, and continue to work on it. I think it is an important issue. Um, but then the threat has, to, and I can't emphasize enough, the threat has to put somebody in fear of bodily injury or death, serious bodily injury or death. It's not just fear that, you know, something else is going to happen. There's disorderly conduct and other means. And, uh, am I correct, Mr. State's Attorney? You are, Senator. Okay. To make that clear. All right. Um, we're going to take a 15-minute break till 